raised here on the east side of Honolulu by immigrant parents. My father came as a young man, conscripted along with his brothers from a rural village in Fukuoka, Japan, to work on the pineapple plantation in Waipahu. My mother came a few years later as a picture bride and came after my father saved enough shekels from his meager earnings to uh, lease a plot of farmland for the vision of state. First in Wailai, across the way from what is now the Kahala Mall. Can you imagine that? And after that, I was sold for housing development. Into, we moved into Kapa'iyali Valley before Henry J. Kaiser drove his St. Lincoln around the area and decided to develop it into what is now Hawaii Kai. I graduated in, from Kalani High School and went to Los Angeles for my first year of college. While I was there, on one of my first Sundays, I went to a Korean language Southern Baptist Church <laughs> with a friend who was a member there to meet girls. <laughs> Just saying. Instead, I met Jesus, and my life was changed forever. I pursued my calling into ministry, went to finish my college, and went to seminary, my first church in rural Waimea, Hawaii, and went to graduate school at Duke and in North Carolina and Emory in Atlanta. I served briefly at the Watch Street Baptist Church following my stint at Duke and later became a part of the Oakhurst Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia, just on the outskirts of Atlanta. I share this because these two churches were formative in my spiritual life. They were two of the most radically progressive churches I have ever known, intent on following Jesus wherever that may be. And I met Jesus again for the first time, as theologian Marcus Ward said. These two churches were so intent on following Jesus that they both were disfellowship which is a polite way of saying kicked out from the Southern Baptist Convention for having the audacity to ordain a woman to ministry and extending an extravagant welcome to members of the PLBTQ community. <laughs> now, these are Southern Baptist churches in the deep south. All of this to say that even though I have never been a Lutheran before, <laughs> amen, thank you, my sister, it is the shared values and vision of Calvary by the Sea that have called Jane and me into our common life here together. And in engaging our original life together, our pastoral and lay leadership have challenged us to consider how Jesus regarded those who have been forced to the margins of our society, economically, socially, and by every other metric, metric you may conceive. Now, in the teaching, we heard this morning from the scripture, which is, uh, for me, a new translation uh, out of uh, the Native American tradition, out of the scripture, which comes from what we commonly call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus 
uses the imagery of salt and light to decide how his disciples are called to relate to the world. Now, Jesus does not say you can be salt and light. Rather, he insists we are salt and light. And the question he places before us is whether we fulfill our function as salt and light in the world. Do you, do we, fulfill our purpose as light by shining in the darkness? Or do you hide your light? And thereby allow darkness to prevail. Do you let your saltiness fulfill its function of spicing up or preserving life? Or have you lost your saltiness? That is to say, have you lost the purpose for which you have been created and called? We are light and salt, Jesus insists, so act like it. If you don't, you lose your reason to exist, and therefore, should not be lazy. Not as well as over to the dark side, by choice or by not choosing at all. Consider a world in which a world where darkness dominates the world and is devoid of life giving life. It was a world Jesus knew painfully well. A world in which the rich and the powerful hung on to wealth and power at the expense of the humanity of the masses. It was a dark, dark time. A world Jesus exposed often in the many parables that he spoke. And into that world of darkness, the darkness of injustice and oppression, hatred and incalculable grief. As the writer in the Hebrew Bible writes, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And Jesus wants you to know that great light is you. In the century since that Jesus spoke, even up to the present day, not much has changed. The inequities and injustices are just as prevalent as during his time. To be the light of the world in such a world as this. Well, let me remind you the Greek view that Jesus uses here is not the singular, but the collective. You all. It's not you or you or you, but all of us together. It is the light we have as a community that Jesus insists that we do not hide. And here at Calvary by the Sea, I rejoice in the fact that we do not hide our light under a bushel. On this particular Sunday, we are asked to consider this aspect of our discipleship as we, the church, and individuals relate to indigenous peoples, Native Americans, Nakanakana Pahoe, Maori, Ainu, and other indigenous peoples throughout the world. People who have a priceless cultural heritage, who have had to walk in darkness because too often people they love them Hospitality and aloha came and were the cause of such misery. We brought the light of the gospel, thanks be to God, 
But tragically, we also brought oppression, economic injustice, sickness, and death as well. And so we must ask ourselves, how can Calvary by the Sea Lutheran Church be light and salt to and with indigenous peoples? It is our task to confront that question all the time, in all the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I want to close with this story. In 1993, on the centennial observation or observance of the unjust overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy by the U.S. government, the denomination I served with most of my vocational life in the United Church of Christ voted to apologize for our complicity in the usurpation of power. After all, the first missionaries to Hawaii in 1820 were the congregationalist predecessors of the United Church of Christ. And so on January 20th, on the anniversary of the overthrow, the president of the United Church of Christ, Paul Cherry, my close friend, stood on the steps of the hill on the palace before hundreds who had gathered to read the apology he was asked to deliver. Now, in the big scheme of things, it was not something major. It was just a small gesture. But I think an important one on behalf of the church. It was only one candle lit in a dark legacy of colonialism and cultural diminishment. But it was still a flickering light of hope and possibility in the name of Jesus Christ. And so when we light our candle, as small as it may seem, as a community founded in the one who is the light of the world, we offer a profound way through the darkness into the light. Jesus challenges us, Calvary by the sea, be the light that you are. Just as in our baptismal vows, may we as a community of faith bravely and foolishly say, Yes. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine.